Welcome to Cooking 100 Year Old Recipes. This video is part two of helpful hints for the young housekeeper. The first helpful hint is cleaning ink. Now, as I mentioned in the previous video, which if you haven't seen it, I will link it. And I talked about how common rust on clothing would have been, or at least a risk of happening in everyday life in a Victorian household. Ink would have been a similar problem. The ballpoint pen had not yet been invented, and that wouldn't happen until, I believe, 19, in the 1930s. So there were still ink pots and the pens that dip into them as writing instruments. And if you've ever used something like that, you know that the tip gives off a very gentle spray when it's writing against the paper. Now, if the ink is wet and you put your forearm down on the table, yes, that's going to not only smear your your writing but it's also going to get on your garment another risk is the ink pot spilling over and with people using writing in their everyday life sending letters out writing notes right you know how we we write things on a daily basis making lists uh, this would have been a very common problem now to remove ink stains it's instructed to wash in a solution of hydrochloric acid and rinse in ammonia water. Wet the spot with warm water, put on Sapolio, which incidentally is still available today and has rave reviews on Amazon. Put on Sapolio, rub gently between the hands and generally the spot will disappear. So next I'm going to talk about carpets. Americans had a absolute love affair with hardwood flooring until the carpets came along. Now in 1829, a 25-year-old entrepreneur, Erasmus Bigelow, invented the power loom for weaving carpets and forever changed the flooring industry. The production of American-made carpet tripled during the next decade. Now this would have been the style that we think of as an oriental rug or a Persian rug. Over the following decades, Many other mills followed suit in the New England area, including Robert Beatty's Beatty Manufacturing Company, which was in Little Falls, New Jersey. Beatty Manufacturing Company continued in business all the way from 1840 until 1979 under other names such as Beatty and Sons and the Little Falls Carpet Mills. Four brothers living in New York State imported a dozen looms from England in the late 1870s and established the Shuttlesworth Brothers Company in Amsterdam, New York. When they produced a new kind of carpet called the Carnac Wilton in 1905, the demand from homeowners was overwhelming. Now, cleaning these carpets, there's a few things to talk about. First, I want to talk about brooms. Tie strands of a new broom closely together. Put into a pail of boiling water and soak for two hours and dry thoroughly before using. In sweeping carpets, keep broom close to floor and work with the grain of the carpet. Occasionally turn broom that it may wear evenly. And not only did this remove debris from the carpet, but it also revived the nap. Before sweeping old carpets, sprinkle with pieces of newspaper rung of water. After sweeping, wipe over with a cloth wrung out of a weak solution of ammonia water, which seems to brighten colors. And the next thing to give cleaning tips on is the copper boiler. And you can't really talk about a copper boiler without talking about what it was used for in plumbing during this time. So a copper boiler is an extremely large vessel and copper, if nothing else, it's a wonderful heat conductor. So this would have been used for the most arduous task of the time, which was laundry. <laughs> it's called Laundry Mondays. People would bring this big container of Actually, it was mostly empty when it was being transported. Of course, it would be very heavy. It would be taken to whatever the heat source would be and buckets of water carried to it to fill it. Now, this would not be a kitchen vessel. Things for cooking and eating would have been done in 
a soup pot or a kettle. This was for household use, so laundry, uh, cleaning, and even sometimes for bathing. In some instances, the actual uh, copper boiler would be permanently installed into the outdoor latrine because indoor plumbing wasn't really refined at that point. So there would have been a coal heating source and there was always going to be some warm water in there for hand washing, for the simple style bathing and whatnot. So cleaning laundry at this time, and even now it's a, I mean, it's just kind of a gross process, isn't it? Uh, not only is uh, laundry not in our modern times necessarily sanitized because washing in our washing machines, the water is not hot enough to sanitize our clothing. Uh, you can use bleach, uh, alcohol like a um, moonshine or vodka, something like that would sanitize your clothes and of course bleach, but you can't use these things, even that high heat on every type of fiber. So some of our clothes just never get sanitized. Now, baby diapers in particular were always boiled because of course they do need to be sanitized because of the soil on them. Now, I've got some images here. You can see what these pots look like, how substantial they are. You'll notice a wooden handle which would keep it cool and away from the hot copper and there's always going to be some type of burn or scalding mark on the bottom from the direct heat source that the pot was mounted on. Now to actually clean the pot, it's instructed that you would use Putt's Pomade Cream, which is still available today. Apply with a woolen cloth when boiler is warm, not hot. Then rub off with a second woolen cloth and polish with a flannel or chamois. If badly polished, use oxalic acid. Faucets and brasses are treated in the same way. So this was a metal cleaning method employed by people in this era. I want to dive in just a little bit into the Gilded Age, which is when this is. It's a more specific period of time during the Victorian era. The indoor gas heated water tank that we certainly enjoy very much today had not yet been invented, as I mentioned earlier, but it was invented about a year after this book was published, in 1889, by a Norwegian mechanical engineer that was working in Philadelphia. His name is Edwin Rudd, and he developed the first automatic storage tank type of gas water heater and he founded the company with several other engineers and patented the invention in 1897. So prior to this invention was the copper boiler. Until the late 19th century, most New Yorkers relied solely on outhouses located in backyards and alleys. And while some residents had their own private outhouses, anyone living in a tenement would have shared facilities with their neighbors. The outhouse resident ratio varied, but in most tenements had just three to four outhouses. In the 19th century, it was not uncommon to find over 100 people living in a single tenement building. This meant that people often shared a single outhouse with anywhere from 25 to 30 of their neighbors, making long lineups and limited privacy common problems. As you might expect, most tenement outhouses were also teeming with rats and other vermin and were a major source of disease. The Dover egg beater was a wonderful invention that absolutely thrilled housewives. And this was an iron, uh, iron, maybe one of, I don't know if it was one of the first kitchen gadgets, but it's one of the early on ones and it's endured to this day. Certainly we've modernized it since then. But it was a heavy iron egg beater. And I find the tip in the book very interesting because it doesn't say how to clean it. It simply says, do not submerge the cogs into water. And considering 
what the egg beater would be used for, eggs, whipping cream, even a makeshift butter maker. How else are you going to clean those, uh, the cogs? I just, I don't really know what, <laughs> it's an incomplete instruction. Um, all right, Listerine is mentioned in this section. So this is a very old product that we, of course, we still know this today, right? Listerine is an excellent disinfectant to use for the mouth and throat. Now let's talk about refrigerators. The modern refrigerator, even modern early on, did not happen for several decades before this book was published. So they were still using something called a ice chest. And it was a, it looked like an armoire. It had compartments much like the iron stove did and blocks of ice were delivered from an ice man that were taken oh, from a frozen lake, frozen snow, stored in these cold houses. And you would get it however often, maybe once a week. And this is what you would use to keep your food from perishing prematurely. So there's instruction to keep an ice chest in good condition, wash thoroughly once a week with cold or lukewarm water in which washing soda has been dissolved. So this leads me to think that the ice came weekly. You would take out whatever little bits was left, wipe down the inside with the washing soda mixture, dry it out, and then receive your new block of ice for the upcoming week. If by chance anything is spilt in an ice chest, it should be wiped off at once. Milk and butter very quickly absorb odors and if in ice chest with other foods, should be kept closely covered. Burn treatment seems to be very much focused on prevention of blistering. For a burn, apply equal parts of white of egg and olive oil mixed together. Then cover with a piece of old linen. If applied at once, no blister will form or apply at once cooking soda, then cover with cloth and keep the same wet with cold water. This takes out the pain and prevents blistering. As mentioned earlier on, Hardwood flooring was extremely popular in America during this time, and you would have seen much more exposed wood around the home than you do in these modern times. Hardwood floors and furniture may be polished by using a small quantity of kerosene oil, which is liquid paraffin, and it's applied with a woolen cloth. Then rub it again with a clean woolen cloth. A very good furniture polish is made by using equal parts linseed oil and turpentine. A polish for hardwood floors would use one part beeswax to two parts turpentine. Put in a saucepan on a range and when wax is dissolved, a paste will be formed. This is enough household tips from the Victorian era for this episode. So I'm going to end it here. And thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed this and subscribe. I hope to see you again.